So good morning. Thank you for coming to this morning's early stage investment and incubators panel. Uh, I'm Eden, I'm a third year PhD student here and I'm from the organizing team. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you uh, our moderator, Christina Chase. Christina is currently an entrepreneur in residence at MIT in the Martin Trust Center, where she helps MIT students launch successful businesses. Christina is an entrepreneur with a track record of success in, in several industries, starting her first company when she was 16 years old. Most recently, she was the CEO and the co-founder uh, of Firehose, an education technology company that focuses on online education. Christina is a Techstars mentor and serves on the board of the MIT <coughs> Enterprise Forum, SXSW Accelerator Adv Advisory Board, and SXSW V2V Advisory Board. In 2013, she was named one of the 25 most influential women in the Boston tech community. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, and good morning. Um, I know it's an early Saturday morning, so it's wonderful to see so many great people here. Um, I am thrilled to have a very accomplished panel today in, before you to help you guys think through both accelerators, incubators, as well as early stage investment. Um, so quickly, just so that we know, how many of you are currently working on a startup or have a project in mind? Raise your hand. Higher, higher, higher for us. Nice, excellent. Okay. So anything that you guys have questions on, certainly feel free to let us know, because we're going to open it up for QA. But this is really all about you guys trying to understand how best you fit into uh, the different models and stage of funding sources that you have in front of us. So as we start this out, um, if I could have all of you just um, give a little bit of background of who you are, what you guys are doing, and the type of stage of startup team you typically work with, that'd be wonderful. Yes, please. Hi everyone, good morning. Uh, my name is Robbie Bidding. I'm Director of Marketing at Mass Challenge. At Mass Challenge, we run the world's largest startup accelerator and also the first to support early stage entrepreneurs with no strings attached. So that means that we run a four month program where we invite 128 entrepreneurs from all over the world in any industry to take part in a four month program here in Boston where they receive free office space, access to lots of mentors, lots of free stuff, a big network. And then at the end of the four month period, we award over a million dollars in grants and all of that is with no strings attached. So uh, no equity taken, uh, no restrictions on the entrepreneurs. So, uh, so for me, uh, I'm, I'm working probably with, I'm working with the earliest stage entrepreneurs of the, of the group. So we work with companies that are uh, anywhere from idea phase, so really uh, pre, uh, could be pre-prototype, pre-revenue, pre-funding, all the way up into about $500,000 of equity-based investment. So certainly a range, but definitely on the earlier side of the, the spectrum. Wonderful. Excellent. Michelle. Hi, everyone. Uh, good to see you all. Um, my name is Xiao Wang. I'm the CEO of InnoSpring. InnoSpring is the first US-China technology incubator. We're based in Santa Clara in the Bay Area in California. Uh, we are uh, more of a fund with the Rolodex of uh, a community of entrepreneurs and founders as part of the, you know, um, the incubator network. We uh, believe in um, supporting entrepreneurs with their peer founders and our network of 80 mentors who help us mentor the founders. But uh, we don't run accelerator programs. Uh, we have our own fund, in the Spring C Fund. We do invest on uh, an ongoing basis. We do 10 to 15 deals a year. We write 50K to 200K checks, but an average is around 100K checks. We bet on the first to the third sort of mini C fund stage. Um, the first check or the second one that entrepreneur would get from investors. We oftentimes co-invest with syndicates, angels, and other C funds, angel funds. Uh, our structure is unique because our own fund um, is backed by, um, you know, all of the I would say most of the first year VCs, growth stage VCs, 
And uh, for a fun one, um, we got investment from Kleiner Perkins, GSR Ventures, Northern Light VC, T. Kendrew Fund, and uh, CBC Ventures. For our fund two, we got investment from um, IDG Capital, uh, Legend Capital, IDG XL, um, SoftBank Fund, um, uh, Northern Light VCs. Um, the reason why we partner with them is because um, the growth stage VCs have uh, motivation to move earlier stages, to, at least to start relationship with uh, good entrepreneurs. Uh, for us, we get their brand, their expertise, and their um, scalable connections uh, all plugged into our platform. Um, we invest. We Oftentimes, we invest in startups that are focusing on China mar uh, U.S. market, but eventually they're interested in growing into a global marketplace like China. That's where we actually can provide a lot of value. That was excellent. We'll have to come back to some of your LPs that are invested in that fund. It's a really interesting model. Sure. Okay, excellent. Okay. Wonderful. Millie. So my name is Millie Liu, and I'm founding partner of Percy Young Ventures. We invest in enterprise software uh, companies, uh, ranging from uh, application to IT infrastructure. So everything is B2B, and it's all data-oriented. So in terms of application, we invest in companies like analytics, algorithm, machine learning in different sectors. We have invested in logistics, uh, retail, e-commerce, um, and like healthcare. So we're pretty much uh, vertical agnostic. And then on the IT infrastructure side, we invest in all the software layers of the IT stack. So from like database, security, uh, network, storage, fiber optics. So we look at all of them. So for what we look at, uh, we look for um, high technical barrier. So most of the entrepreneurs that we back, a lot of them are, say, uh, PhDs, professors, and some of them are university dropouts. Uh, most of them comes with very hardcore technology. And also, they're mostly globally transferable, which they're facing a global market. Uh, we typically invest, our first check size is a few hundred K, and then we follow on with a few uh, million of investment. Uh, a few million dollars in terms of investment. Uh, we work with, so in terms of like how we work with entrepreneurs, we help them a lot in terms of um, team building, recruiting, helping them get customers both in uh, US and in some global markets, um, such as in China. So we work with a lot of uh, the, the tech companies here in the US and also in China and with um, uh, CIOs of, uh, of potentially, basically CIOs of these potential customers of our portfolio companies. So that's one of the big ad, uh, value adding to our portfolio companies. Excellent. Thanks, Millie. Jalak. Thanks. Hi, I'm Jalak Jobin Putra, uh, founding a partner of Future Perfect Ventures. It's uh, great to be here and see so many of you here on a Sunday morning. Um, so Future Perfect Ventures is an early stage fund uh, based in New York City, uh, focused on what I'm calling interpretive intelligence, uh, which is smart data applications uh, across uh, verticals. Um, and uh, I've been in BC for over 15 years uh, in the Valley, London, New York, Boston, and um, also saw a gap in uh, true kind of cross-border in investing. Uh, so, you know, entrepreneurs here based in the U.S. who get traction in, in different countries uh, and, and don't really have the support to, to go out and, and uh, do BD and, and really tackle those markets or companies founded elsewhere who, uh, you know, have a, a more global market than their, their uh, home market and, and really helping them get established in, in the U.S. So um, other than the thesis around smart data, I'm particularly interested in, in those types of companies and entrepreneurs. Um, current portfolio includes quite a bit of financial services, having being based in New York. Uh, there's certainly 
uh, quite a bit of domain expertise there. Uh, blockchain, um, which is a Bitcoin, the largest Bitcoin wallet um, in the world, is one of the portfolio companies. Open Garden, a wireless mesh network, which recently got a lot of press in Hong Kong, um, is, is, is another one. Uh, and of 15 portfolio uh, companies total so far, it's um, usually sweet spot is up to 500,000 first money in and then uh, supporting the companies and uh, follow on investing. Thanks. So as you see, we have uh, quite the range for you guys. So regardless of what stage you're in, you've got experts who can help you think about where you should be hooking in and how to get to that next stage. So um, let's even just start on that early stage part. Um, what, the, what is the difference between an incubator and an accelerator? Robbie, yeah, maybe so you can help us here. I, I get that one a lot. So, uh, so at Mass Challenge, we call ourselves an accelerator. Uh, but even uh, we have a, a pretty strange model. So the, uh, the terms are kind of up in the air. And so when, when I think about it, typically I think of an accelerator as something that has a program, a fixed program with a distinct sort of beginning and end uh, with a sort of uh, fixed cohort of companies. Uh, typically, there's a, a mentorship and uh, some sort of investment or celebration or demo day at the end of the program to kind of uh, jumpstart and launch these uh, program or these companies into the sort of re real world. Uh, a incubator might be a little bit fuzzier. It might be uh, more of a sort of co co-working office space situation where there isn't necessarily a start time or an end time. Companies might sort of uh, come and go, not necessarily all at the same time. Uh, so there's maybe a little bit of a different sense of urgency with an accelerator and an incubator, but uh, so th that's the that's usually how I think of it. Great, Shao, do you have some thoughts with what InnoSpring's doing, and right. and you guys switched as well? Yeah, um, initially when we founded ourselves in April 2012, we were experimenting how what's the best model to engage with entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. We've tried to run two accelerator programs. We try to build a community of entrepreneurs that's kind of existing network that we work with right now. We always been investing aggressively, but we also are experimenting um, where we invest the money in. Do we back our accelerator programs? Do we back outside of that? So we, we've done that in 2012, 2013-ish, and we decided to trickle down into running this ongoing investing because we don't know where entrepreneurs are coming from. It's hard for us to time a fixed class in a, within a fixed period of time. Um, but I would agree to that, to the differences between incubator and accelerator program. I would um, also add on to that, the incubator itself is a very broad concept. I've seen um, perhaps more than a half of in incubators, even in the US, don't directly invest in startups. They could just be a um, co-working space with some mentors. Um, people run incubators with very different purposes. Um, um, and the models could be very different. There are also nonprofit and government-run incubators. So for entrepreneurs, they really need to carefully learn the model itself and try to decide if this is something useful for them. Excellent. It, this is a very good point. So it's really understanding what are you trying to get out of the program and what are those expectations and how is it going to help you with your particular business in whatever industry you're going into. So um, another confusing point could be what is an angel and what is seed funding? That sounds like something you'd give to birds, right? Like, what's the amount and range and what is the difference between angel and series A and VC and you know, super angel? Millie? Sure. Um, well, I think first, seed or pre-seed, uh, <laughs> A, B, it's really just defining uh, if it's the first time you're raising, second time, or third time, it's really just a timeline. So in terms of the stage of where you are, it could largely vary. Um, but in general, I'll say probably when you're talking about like angel round or seed round, is mostly <laughs> when you have idea and you're working on product, um, and this is more for like the product development process, and you're still kind of trying to figure out, okay, I kind of know this is what I want to do, but I'm not really sure, let's go out and try things out, and in the meanwhile, we have some, like that's why you call it angels, right? 
um, really helping you, believing in you, and supporting you. And then once you pass that stage, and that's where I see uh, that's more like Series A, where you, um, you're looking for product market fit. You're trying to figure out, okay, this is the product that is kind of validated by the market, but I'm trying to figure out if there's actually a, a large enough of addressable market, and this is uh, how I'm gonna set up my business model, how will sell, how do I, do I go to the market. So that's where I see typically of Series A, and from uh, Series A to like Series B, that's where, um, okay, I find a product market fit, I think this is the stage that I start to grow and hit that growth trajectory, um, and onward is really more kind of growth stage. Though I think nowadays we're seeing a shift between like seed and series A. Um, a lot of the companies who are less more mature, they are in the, the, the A stage uh, because of this like series A crunch or this uh, overall um, trend of uh, the, the large volume of angel money um, getting into the market. So it really all depends. Um, I've seen, for example, um, a, a counter example of one of my portfolio. Um, it's a C stage because it's the first time that I ever raise external money, but then the founders have already put um, 10 million of his <coughs> private wealth and uh, the, the company it already has about 100 uh, employees all over the world. And when we got in, it was the C stage, and we're the <laughs> first institutional money. But it's really more of an A by um, what you commonly call it. Yeah. So, but at the end of the day, I think it really comes down to it's really defining like if you have raised it for the, the timeline of your fundraising, mm -hmm. then the stage. Um, Jalik, are you, uh, do you see something similar? And the other piece is um, if you could also help define some of the check, the common check sizes for each stage, that I think that would be also helpful for yeah, I, it, entrepreneurs it, it, out in the audience. I mean, I've seen a shift just in the last six months on this, and having done this for 15 years, you certainly, I, I feel like this, you know, these definitions are very, you know, vary by year and, and market condition. Um, I mean, about a year ago, we were seeing, you know, some uh, very, very large seed rounds, I mean, you know, of up to $20 million, which, you know, right now would be, you know, an A or a B round. Um, so what I'm really seeing right now in the current market is, um, you know, there, there is still a lot of angel money um, and uh, AngelList and all these different platforms for angels to invest. Um, so you're seeing an initial round uh, of, um, you know, maybe up to a million dollars uh, being done at that really early stage often in the form of a convertible note. Um, and then, and this is where my fund, uh, you know, usually comes in, where um, the entrepreneurs are looking for, um, uh, you know, if they have some proof of concept looking to scale that and find product, uh, more of a product market fit. Uh, but there's some kind of referenceable traction uh, that's already starting to happen. And, um, and so that's what, you know, a lot of uh, companies are, are raising what's a series seed, which, which um, I mean, my preference is to do, you know, pr uh, priced rounds. And so uh, that may be the first institutional money. And then, you know, then the series A, uh, uh, and I'd say the series seed is anywhere, you know, uh, maybe up to three to five million dollar rounds, and then uh, the A's gotten uh, bigger than where it was 10 years ago, um, which is, uh, you know, usually uh, up to uh, 20, and then scaling from there. Okay, you hit two terms. Real quick question. How many people know what a price round versus a convertible note is? Raise your hand. Okay, would you define what the differences are for those? For those sure, sure. Audience? Okay, I apologize for you. No, no, no. <laughs> we talk about this terms. all the time. Right, and so right. We forget <laughs> that this it's uh, insider lingo, which is really annoying probably to some of you guys. But we're, we're well, but it, but we're it's totally very important. It's yeah. very important for entrepreneurs <laughs> to to know this. Um, yeah. And I actually spend 
time mentoring entrepreneurs on on all of this because it's it's absolutely essential to you know to understand. Um, so convertible notes are actually they're not um, they're they're a, a debt instrument. Uh, so you're technically not giving away equity um, in in the company. It's uh, the the terms vary, but uh, the debt so you know an investor may you know say invest twenty thousand dollars they get a debt instrument that says that's convertible upon certain terms it's usually another round of funding sometimes they get a discount to that funding uh, and then there's um, you know valuation caps which protects them um, you know if the valuation goes above say ten million uh, they're guaranteed to convert at uh, under that at, at that amount. Um, uh, so uh, and and a price round is simply equity. You know what the valuation is. You know how much of the company you're giving away. Um, and uh, pre money is uh, value of the company before the money comes in. So an investor may invest it say a five million uh, pre-money valuation if uh, the company's raising three, the company is then worth five plus three, eight million post money. So that's kind of the, the bottom of where the next round should be raised at, um, which is why it's, you know, entrepreneurs often optimize for valuation, but uh, what's important is to figure out how much you're going, how much you think you're going to raise down the road because one of the worst things you can do is have down down rounds where the valuation becomes less, the next round valuation becomes less than the post money of the previous round. That was excellent. Thank you. Oh, Michelle, you want to? Right. I just want to comment on something that Jack just said about um, the new C, C is new A, the A is new B, and everything about Series A crunch. I think I see a lot of entrepreneurs who want to sit, call themselves the raising angel round when they're actually, in fact, raising seed round. They when they 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 want to call themselves raising seed round when they actually want want a Series A money because they wanted to be um, want to make the investors feel impressive when they come out, they already have some traction, they're supposed to go out and raise C, uh, A round, and they want to say, we're still raising C round, i.e. giving them more uh, runway before raising a Series A. Um, that's kind of contributed to this new phenomenon of C become new A, because in the past, if you raise $2 million, $3 million, it's a Series A. But now, like, everybody's calling it seed, and it's so typical to see companies raising $5 million, $10 million, and still calling themselves a Series a seed round, but the problem really is is now that investors are, are changing the way that they do it, the Series A investors now not only look at product market fit, they're looking at scale, they're looking at traction because, I mean, the other companies already raised huge seed rounds. For them, they have to write uh, more checks, uh, larger check for, uh, there, right there, and so they're looking at more numbers that kind of contribute to why it's, it's not easy to get um, Series A money these days. Um, I guess... In, you know, overall, entrepreneurs can call their round whatever they want, but if you already raised more than $3 million and you still want to raise money from the typical Series A fund, and there's going to be careful, if you still call them yourself raising a seed, I think, you know, Series A fund investor might really have a problem with that. I mean, the valuation just isn't going to be really the right for them. And um, the sole phenomenon of raising the Series seed is also quite dangerous because a lot of inexperienced um, entrepreneurs I see just like to keep raising the cap and continue to raise an open seat. But a lot of them still raise seat with the document where there's terms in there <laughs> where the entrepreneurs keep raising the price, but if they come down raising a down round, then you have a tons of investors actually looking to make 200% in return before they actually convert to equity. Then the cap table is going to be all over the place. And when you have a cap table with 10 investors, they all have a, a, a wildly different pricing and terms, and when you come out and try to raise Series A, it's very, very hard for Series A investors to work out the, the terms. I've seen companies getting turned down because Series A investors just cannot work out their terms, and they just cannot come in. So, this is a really, really good point. So I think this can be a little confusing. So what it really comes down to is what is the investor going to get out of making this investment? And that's, so if you would just maybe expand on that a little Actually, bit. So, for CSA investors, usually each invest, the institution investor, if they put in money in there, they have to have um, enough 
ownership of the company for them to make sense of the investment. So usually for Series A investment, um, you know, the, the, the institution funds would perhaps want to get 20% of the company. But if, if before you raise uh, Series A at seed round, you already given out enough equity out, and then you just don't have 20% to give to the investor, but the founder still retain enough motivation to run the company itself. So the cap table itself, it really it makes sense. You have to really time it how much money you want to um, you want actually before you can raise Series A, and how much ownership you're willing to give out, and still leave enough room for your Series A investor to come in, write you a check you need, and still have the ownership for them to make sense of the investment. So oftentimes it's, it's calculating how much money you want and when you need. Uh, in terms of running, uh, raising a Series A, and then backtrack how, man, how much equity you can give out at seed, seed round. It's not just about um, having a, a huge valuation right um, up front. A lot, of invest, a lot of entrepreneurs I see really get proud about their valuation, but not really thinking about the future. Sometimes having a, hard, a high valuation at seed round is not working to your advantage as actually a bad thing because now you have a lot, a ton more um, expectation of where you should be at Series A round. So, right. um, much what Jalik was saying. And Millie, do you have something? Yeah, to I mention? just want to add to that. I'm seeing, um, uh, just um, speaking to Xiao's point, I'm seeing two extremes. One is some of the entrepreneurs, they will just keep raising seed round for every, like, every one or two months, there's new. Uh, seed round with a little bit higher valuation <coughs> and then another one. So you're seeing very messy cap table either at the price round or uh, or a convertible note round. And I, I think, you know, for entrepreneurs, like fundraising is a lot of efforts. That means you can't focus on uh, acquiring your customers and building a product. Um, and then on the other extreme I'm seeing is uh, they raised, they started out raising like a huge round, <coughs> which they'll probably have enough money for at least next five, 10 years, if they are still there. And they start buying office, buying offices, not even renting. And there's just two extremes. And I think what really makes sense is typically you raise a round for uh, for the runway of next 12 to 18 <coughs> months, and, or maybe even 12, uh, 24 months. And that's the period of time that you really project, okay, realistically, this is the money that I'm going to use for like customer acquisition, for hiring, expanding a team, hiring sales, all that stuff. And after that, this is the, the, the milestone I'm going to hit. And before that, what is the realistic valuation that you're currently thinking, and what is the, the milestone uh, two years later or 18 months later? Uh, months later. So you will go out and raise the next round at a higher valuation. So I'm seeing two extremes of keep optimizing on the valuation by raising tiny little rounds uh, uh, along the way. But it really is very time consuming and effort consuming and your capital is pretty messy. Uh, investors don't like it. And the other extreme is raising a huge round. That means you're diluting yourself early on. Um, and you know you might even need that much of money. Yeah. So these are really interesting points that I don't think a lot of entrepreneurs have insight to until they've been in the fundraising process. So um, all of you work with teams at different stages. I would love if each of you would very clearly articulate what are some of the key characteristics you look for in a team and in a business when they come talk to you. So Robbie, let's start with you. When, when you have mass challenge teams applying, what are some of the key characteristics you're looking for to really build out that class of, of individuals? Sure. So. Uh like I said before, we're working with some of the earliest stage entrepreneurs. So unlike some of these other guys, I'm not, I'm not looking at cap tables or revenue numbers necessarily. Uh, and so when we're working with entrepreneurs who maybe don't have any funding or any revenue or even a, a prototype to show for, it can be really tough to evaluate sort of uh, how, how much traction uh, these entrepreneurs have. Early stage traction can be very tricky. So at Mass Challenge, the way we define that is uh, we're looking for high impact and high potential. Uh, the way we define high impact, and because we're working with entrepreneurs across any industry, it's uh, meant to be very broad. So impact, the way I think of it is, uh, why is it important that this venture succeeds? It could, if you're a healthcare company, it might be measured in lives saved or addressing a, a large patient population. Uh, it might be about acquiring a large number of users 
or it could be uh, something that's uh, revenue-driven as well. Uh, high potential is what are your chances of actually getting there? So uh, when you're a little bit further along, you have some, some uh, funding behind you, uh, some revenue, you can speak to that sort of sales traction uh, or product development. But when you're, when you're early stage and you don't have a product, uh, that can be harder to evaluate. So the things that we look at are a few things. Uh, one, primarily team. So who, what's, the, what's the team behind the venture? Why are these the right people uh, to solve that problem, uh, to, to bring the venture to market? Real quick on that, what makes for a good team? Oh, a good team, let's see. So typically we want to see uh, a couple of founders. We, we certainly get uh, solo, uh, like uh, one team companies coming to Mass Challenge, but usually it's, it's uh, two or three founders that have complementary uh, backgrounds. So you might have a technical and a non-technical founder, that's pretty common. So you mean not all engineers are all business people? That's right, yeah, usually, <laughs> usually, usually it's a mix. Uh, we definitely see the companies that might be uh, you know, stacked with a bunch of MBAs who have a really good understanding of the market and a really good understanding of the problem at hand, but need some help building the product. Uh, or the, uh, we definitely see the other side, especially with a lot of teams coming out of MIT, really, really excellent technology. Uh, with uh, really excellent advisors uh, behind the team, but they still need uh, some help uh, understanding the market, uh, understanding the sales strategy, that sort of thing. So uh, at Mass Challenge, it, basically it's okay if you don't have all the solutions figured out. Uh, I think maybe, maybe so, so maybe one of the biggest things that we look for in entrepreneurs is having a good understanding of where you are, what stage you're in, what your biggest problems are. And so, uh, so you don't need to have everything figured out, it's more about understanding uh, the pieces of the puzzle that are missing and what you need to get there. Excellent, wonderful, super helpful. Uh, Shell. Uh, uh, even though we invest in, in the first, second, or third stage, uh, the funding stage that entrepreneurs get, we invest in commercially viable ideas. Um, so we are um, a fund ourselves. We we have we have our own expectations in terms of the return. So what is the expectation for the return? Um, it's, it's not a promise, I think for seed fund, um, the industry benchmark is 20% year to year, um, but most seed funds promise more, I mean you can't really promise, but they expect more, um, but I have to say more than 75% of seed fund can't live up to the benchmark, even though you know there hasn't been a really a good status, kind of status around there, out there in the public to actually analyze really where the industry standard in terms of performance really is. But um, we, we're looking to back um, entrepreneurs who really knows how to take their product and um, technology into market, and we focus on consumer or enterprise SaaS space. For consumer, we're looking for ideas that um, can quickly lead to massive user acquisition. For enterprise, we're looking to find technology that really solves the real pain point in enterprise space. Um, we don't typically invest in just ideas unless the founding team have made money for investors in the past. Um, we have made exception just here and there, but not typically. Um, and we're looking to find uh, clear leaders within the, the founding team, at least one person who understand the, the market, the business development, that type of things, that the, uh, the business part of things, um, where we don't typically, we'll be cautious if the founding te teams are all heavily technology folks, okay. so. Excellent. Millie, what about you? Do you have like key characteristics, like a checklist? <laughs> Make um, sure they have these types of characteristics. <laughs> yeah, we uh, we look for the, the. I think it comes down to probably three big categories. One is founder, one is market, and the other is the product. So in terms of founders, we typically invest in. Um, you don't have to be a technical founder yourself, or at least in within your team, the uh, you are able to deliver. A, um, a highly technically challenging solu uh, sol solution. And uh, so typically the team, there are some great um, 
technology um, or, or software engineers in terms, because we only invest in software. And they're typically, especially for founders, we look for, they have a vision, uh, and a lot of these things are inter, intertwined. For example, like they have a vision for a product, they know like why they're doing this, um, like first what they're doing, why this is a team, and why now in terms of the timing. And the team, um, in terms of characteristics, um, I love founders when they have great vision, they're technically capable, or they can find people who are capable, they understand the market, and they're so tenacious and scrappy, just so perseverant. That's definitely the quality that we look for. Um, and then in terms of the, the market, um, how big is the addressable market, how they can go about the, the, the go-to market, what's the business model. Um, you know, a lot of things you don't necessarily have to figure out, especially when we first invest in the very early stage, but just have a very thoughtful answer, uh, really think through a lot of the questions about what you're doing now and what you will do in the next five or even 10 years. Um, and then in terms of the product, for us, we actually, uh, during our due diligence process, we actually break down the product and really drill into it. So for example, we will literally uh, grow the, the technical team in terms of, oh, what is your technical backhand? What's your architecture? How does your database connect to each other? How do you scale a certain customer base? And how do you uh, further scale when you, when you, uh, when you grow? Um, but I think overall speaking, you don't have to have necessarily a, a great, perfect answer for every single question, but I'm really looking for founders who are thoughtful and who have an idea of uh, what he's trying to do and why, like what are the reasons why he's going after this or what are the assumptions uh, he's trying or she, she or he is trying to validate for the next <coughs> stage and what are the approaches. So know where you're strong and know where you're weak. Right. That's um, excellent. Right. And in terms of uh, investment, we typically look for uh, post product. They have not necessarily like a perfect complete product, but um, at least some prototype or like beta products that's already um, validated uh, in the market with the customers. And some of uh, the companies that we've invested in, they have revenue, some don't. So uh, in what type of validation are you looking for? Um, so validation in terms of, I think, because we invest in enterprise. Right. So really uh, validation from the customers who are buying your products or who are piloting with you. What do your customers say about you? If you don't have any yet, that's also fine because I will also bring in the CIOs of our network who are potentially your buyers. And sometimes I'll set up meetings or calls uh, for your team and the, your potential customers basically going through a product uh, to validate there is a value that you're actually solving a, a, a problem for these enterprise clients. Okay. Right, and uh, in terms of the revenue, it could from starting from no revenue at all and for our portfolio, we invested in somewhere ranging from a couple hundred K a year uh, annual recurring to like a few million. Okay, these have all been great answers, so I don't want to repeat, <laughs> but I agree uh, w with them. Um, I'd say, and, and we touched on this a little bit, um, uh, the, the number one characteristic of successful entrepreneurs is resilience, and um, I think that is you know, key in, in evaluating an entrepreneur um, in, in terms of there's always going to be downs, um, you know, it, even the overnight successes we hear about are not overnight successes by any means. And uh, most of these companies have come very, very close to running out of capital. And it's really, what, it, what is the character of the entrepreneur and how are they going to be able to get through uh, those difficult times? And, and part of it is self-awareness. Uh, another part is, uh, you know, knowing what you know and don't know, and and taking counsel in uh, when when you've reached you know what you don't know, and and uh, this is an issue I find with um, you know a lot of uh, first time entrepreneurs where they think they have to have it all figured out and don't go to their investors until they're really you know uh, to the point where. It's difficult for the investors to then, you know, help them out. So, you know, and 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 part of it is 
picking the right investors that, that you have transparency with where, you know, I always, uh, you know, I'd rather, I, I want to hear the bad news first, <laughs> you know, um, and, and be able to problem solve with, with the entrepreneurs. And it's really up to the entrepreneurs to pick the right folks around them, because not all investors are going to be as open and um, valuable in that way. This is a really important point that you bring up. What does it mean to you when you speak to um, uh, mentoring teams to pick the right investors? What does that look like? Well, it's it's a two-way process, right? Um, and uh, everyone, uh, you know, I've heard this analogy all the time that it's like a marriage, right? Where um, and often investments last longer than marriages these days. I don't know. I haven't been married, so I can't comment on that. <laughs> but um, it, it's uh, really getting to know each other. I mean, I, I have entrepreneurs who come up to me. They're in my thesis area. I don't know them, and they'll say, "We're closing in two days." And I, I, I just won't do that unless I've known the entrepreneur. Um, and it, it's those situations rarely end well, and, and because you don't have, you haven't built up that relationship. Um, and, and so um, I, I'd say just, you know, go with your gut. I mean, that, that's, uh, do, you, do you feel like you can be open with this person? And, and are they in competitive? I mean, this is one thing uh, with the amount of investing that's happening. Are they in competi you know, competitive deals? Like you can ask other entrepreneurs that have taken money from them. Um, and, and those are all questions that you should ask. Um, and uh, you know, the, the right investor who's really interested in helping you build the business is not going to mind these, these questions. OK, hypothetically, someone comes up to you with a consumer hardware play. Would that be a good fit? <coughs> So I, I've invested in hardware. Actually, one of my portfolio companies is, 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 is in hardware. Um, it, you know, first and foremost, is it's about the entrepreneur. Um, I don't love consumer. Just, I mean, I've had, you know, a, a lot of success in the B2B space. Um, but there's a lot of overlap these days. I mean, most of what I see is B2B to C. Uh, so there's some consumer component. Um, so, I mean, I can't just answer that question because that's a very large sector. That sounds like a really nice no. <laughs> that's what it sounds like. I think, I, I think something important no, that's for... That's not true. I, I, that's not true. No? It's, it's, so it's, it's a maybe? No, it's exactly what I said. Okay. I think, I think what Christina was trying to get is really do some homework before you talk to investors. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, if you go to Mass Challenge, great. Like, you guys are much more... Uh, broad in terms of the thesis of the companies that you're taking. But then, for example, for, for me, we only invest in enterprise. So if you're a consumer play, the, the, it could be a good B2B to C once you pivot. But you're talking about like a social app. Then it's really not my thing. And maybe um, Jalak will have a, a, a more, more receptive to, to those kind of deals. But you probably want to go for the consumer uh, oriented investors. So a lot of times, I also have this personal struggle of, you know, as a fund, we st I want to stay very disciplined of doing what I'm really good at. And I have a lot of great friends who work on great consumer products. And I'm so proud of them. I help them as a personal friends. But I just can't invest in them. And I'll send them to my other consumer uh, investors who will invest and back these uh, entrepreneurs. And really, picking investor is it really is like getting married. And getting married, you can get divorced, but it's really hard to get rid of an uh, investor once you are married. So uh, I've I think I personally, I've been very fortunate having this both very tight professional and personal relationship with my entrepreneurs. A lot of the times, entrepreneurs, just as you said, uh, they have to, or you have to feel comfortable of calling up your investor and uh, tell them the bad news. And if you don't feel comfortable with your investor, maybe there's something wrong, or maybe you're not... Um, you're not getting married with the, 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 the best person that you should. Um, and a lot of the times, like entrepreneurs, uh, before I invest in these companies, sometimes we've known each other for two, three years, or even longer. And occasionally, we've known each other for only a few months. But it just in between those like two or three months, 
it's a lot of knowing each other, hanging out, uh, grabbing lunch and dinner together, knowing what's their personal aspiration of working on what they're, whatever they're working now, and really get to know each other. And also from the entrepreneur's perspective too, you should really know your investors. And for us, we actually don't invest in companies that we feel we cannot add value. Um, at the end of the day, especially if you're a good company, there will be a lot of money chasing after you, but money is commoditized. So really, what is one, the strategic value behind the money brought in by the investor? Can they bring you more customers? Can they help you with the product development? Can they help you with recruiting? Uh, can they point you with the strategic uh, direction that you should head to, especially for first-time entrepreneurs, you would need a lot of guidance and help and support. And also, on top of that, is the personal relationship. It could be a great investor, can give you all the resources, but you can't get along. Or let's say, I mean, there are all different kinds of people out there. They may be a-hose, and they, they are, they're perfect at everything else, but they, they're a-hose. You should not work with them, right? So it's really like getting a married. So um, <laughs> there are a lot of the, the personal relationship <laughs> dimensions or dynamics going on, and in addition to just the terms of the financials that you're, you should be thinking ahead. This is fantastic. You I guys, actually want to Oh, I love that. it, Shai. Like, um, <laughs> <laughs> no, Milia makes some really good point. I, I want to say that when you're early, you, you're going to need a lot of help before you find out where you're who your customer really is and where, where you can find them. Um, so when you're early, because you're raising less money, you really want to get um, value added, uh, values, different type of value added from you know, a party round investor if you can. If you have a choice, work with investors who have something else other than the money. So if you can, uh, you have uh, the big funds interested in you guys, like Google Ventures and Justin Horowitz, the, the top tier guys, get them for their brand. But really, when you're early, you need investors who have time for you at the end of the day. So I have seen really good startups that raise money from the top tier guys, um, managing directors of Google Ventures. This is one example that we co-invested in. Given that they have so many resources, they have you know, a, lot, a great brand, they have a, a tons of resources. But if the managing director don't have time for you, if they have, what, 50 companies that they have invested in and most of them are bigger than you, they just seriously can't. They, don't, they have no time. Right. So um, the, compared to that, if you have more of a less um, what you, privileged investors, but they, because they care about you, they themselves are hungry of growing the business with you, they have time with you, then those are the investors you want. But you get the Google Ventures first, but then you also want people that can help you along the way and they're willing to spend time with you. Also, um, you know, there are other investors that you could get that might be helpful. Um, you could choose to have an investor who don't really understand your space, technically speaking, but if this person is a connector in a space that you want, get the connectors. It's much better than getting someone who is unwilling to connect you to somebody else. I've, I've had startups in our portfolio where they have investors who are kind of um, like a really important um, legendary technologists in their space, but this guy just is, is so, so nerdy, he's a nerdy person, the technology <laughs> folk. He's just <laughs> unwilling to do anything with the company. I mean, he's all nice, really good guy, not a jackass. He works, <laughs> he really likes the founder, but these guys just unwilling to connect any resources to the company. So it ended up being really just not useful, other than the guy's name on the board. So it's really for a different set of reasons. But of course, on the other hand, if you guys really don't have a choice, get money, just get you know, money from, from whoever write you a check, so. I just want to add to Xiao's point, like, great, and, and one thing is, you, you have to understand, nobody is perfect, nobody can do everything. So really, as an entrepreneur, you can do everything as well, so you really need to map out, like, it, it's like a puzzle, like, these are all the pieces that you need, and uh, from yourself and from your team, you have certain qualities, but then no investor can complete you for all the other pieces. So you really have to map out, oh, these are the areas of the helps that I would need, either it being brand name or like time or uh, making connections, and really map them out and strategically select 
who are the investors that you want to bring on board so that collectively they complement each other and with you, they complement you for a complete puzzle. That's an excellent point and, and what Xiao is speaking to as well. So um, it's not just trying to have everything in one package, but maybe having bucketed and then filling out with your advisory board to then be able to help fill those other gaps. This is excellent. And, and I think one great way is also, if there are, uh, say, individuals that you really want them to get involved, they're not necessarily um, uh, an institutional investor, I'd also advise um, having them as an advisor or mentor or even potentially participating as a small angel investor, that's also a great way to really tie your network with the people from, uh, with the expertise. That's excellent. So um, we want now to open it up to you to understand what questions you might have for our esteemed panelists. So um, excellent. And I don't know if there's a mic coming up, but please, you've, don't worry. We'll just, we'll repeat it if we need to. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Since we were talking about, like, I hate to say that, but like, quality of investors, um, uh, I've read articles online saying that there's some kind of like, investors out there that they're like vouchers. Right? They, they want to take a piece of you, and they also want to have a lot of say in your day to day operation, or they're making strategic decisions on your behalf. And, is that true? I mean, are that kind of investment out there, and we should be aware of that? Thanks. Well, I think there there are all kinds of entrepreneurs, there are all kinds of investors. Uh, there's definitely a broad range of the people that you will, you will interact with. Um, and I think it is true, there are investors who might be more on that extreme of the, the, the spectrum. But um, I think most of the investors, or at least what I think, who I think I should be is, I am an investor and not a CEO or um, who will want to jump in and run the operation for you. If that's the way, then I'll be an entrepreneur myself. Myself, I won't be an investor. So I think you, you raised a good point about every time when you bring in an investor or whoever it is, like what are you looking for for this person or from this uh, uh, from this uh, uh, organization, um, so that it really fulfills uh, the mission that you're looking for this person to fulfill. And um, I, it, it's interesting you, you bring that up because I was on the phone with an entrepreneur uh, last week who I. Um, uh, it's not in my, uh, she's not in my space, so I'm not an investor, but I've been a mentor. And um, uh, she, she encountered this and um, had been building a relationship with an investor for a while and got a term sheet and was uncomfortable with the amount of control that he wanted in the company. And, uh, but she had kind of warning signs along the way. Um, and, and so that sort of thing, it seems like it, it it will rear itself at some point, if, and, and it often happens. I mean, it, when it happens, a lot of times it is with angels um, at an early stage. Um, I mean, there are VCs who will want large chunks of your company and want uh, you know board control, and so that that does happen. Uh, but in in the more nuanced way, it, it's often at an earlier stage, and. Um, and, and that's where, you know, talking to other entrepreneurs who this person has invested in. And, you know, as a VC, I've, I, I have a portfolio of, you know, a number of companies. So I actually, even if I wanted to go in and run one of these companies, I don't have the time to do that. So that's the other thing is to ask what else, you know, the, the investor has invested in. I mean, you don't want them to be too busy to not be able to help you, you know, in these strategic ways we've discussed, but may, if they have too much time on their hands, it, it could be an issue too. That's excellent recommendation. So do your homework, reference check with other entrepreneurs to understand what that working relationship's like, have a clear and, expectation. And just always feel free to ask for a reference check. Um, good in investors shouldn't be hesitating to give you the context of other uh, portfolio companies that they invested in. Yes, but they'll only give you the good ones. <laughs> Ask for the bad ones. <laughs> yeah, that's what LinkedIn is for. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, excellent. Who else has a question? Sure. Thanks, to all the panelists, for the great discussions. Uh, I just have one simple question. Uh, for very early stage startups, uh, 
do you think when would be a good time or right time for the founding team to consider like formally incorporating a company? Related and otherwise on incorporating a company in terms of where and uh, maybe a which type. So, thanks. Who would like to take that? Incorporating where you need to, i.e. if you are actually initiating dialogues with investors and thinking about when you need the money in, then you should incorporate before that. And, uh, and at Mass Challenge, we definitely see companies who, companies who are applying and are definitely not incorporated yet, uh, especially in the social venture space where they're still figuring out, am I an L3C, am I a nonprofit, am I for profit? Uh, so uh, figuring out those strategic uh, answers before incorporating is, is really important. So part of the reason they're coming to a place like Mass Challenge is to figure out those answers. Excellent. <coughs> Wonderful. Hi. Uh, actually, I have a, a particular question for Ms. Liu. So uh, for the B2B enterprise solutions, my understanding is that such a startup company may take a long time to uh, finally get the production to the company because the research and development that take a couple of years and finally integrated your our solution to a company may take another one or two years. So as an investor, what would be your expectation regarding to the time horizon or the investment process? <coughs> Thank you. Um, I, I think it is true in general enterprise sales is harder. But also for enterprise clients, the need is also more urgent. Um, if you are solving a problem that they urgently need, I've seen entrepreneurs who has nothing and well, they have some. They have a team. They have a, some prototype, uh, but they don't have like a real product. But they will basically go to their client and say, "Hey, we will build this." Um, solution that you're you're craving for for you and the clients will pay you to develop your product and that's typically the best thing and that's the best validation that I can see from the market and I think there is within enterprise there's also a broad range for example some companies they're profitable from day one and some companies um, there's a bioinformatics company that we invested in it took them three years and hundred uh, about a hundred uh, people team to build just to build a product before they can even go to market and that's really where it's more uh, capital intensive and the investors will really have to uh, bet in the team early on and um, it, it will be a longer journey for the investors but I think there, there are two um, in a way it's two different profiles of companies you're building and it, we should discuss them separately yeah, and also I think speaking to your point, you talk about how from research to industry, um, it is an issue that I'm seeing a lot of the entrepreneurs who come from the academia setting and it's, it's a great core academic research, but how do you transfer that into a real business? Um, and that's where, you know, knowing where's, what's your strength and weaknesses and Finding, for example, if your PhD, you have a great product or great technology, but you don't really know how to sell or how would this be applied in the in the market, go out and find some executives, senior executives from the industry who really understand the the market dynamic, and f feel free to offer uh, if you forgot if you're comfortable. Uh, for them to be your CEO and really lead this company to the uh, commercialization. Great. Thank you very much. Hey, so it looks like we have time for one more question from the audience. Anything else that people are wondering about, whether it's accelerators, incubators, early stage? Yes. Uh, I was wondering uh, if you think it's better to get some pre graduate, if it's better to work for a larger company uh, before starting a company, before joining a startup, to get some experience, especially if you are on the sales side, the business side of the startup. Well, I, I think it's, I mean, if you have an idea and, and, you know, something you're passionate about, and this is the other thing, you know, all successful entrepreneurs have is passion for, for their idea, then I'd say go for it, you know, start the company. Um, I, I, I actually, you know, I, 
I was at, I, I did investment banking, I was at Intel, I was at Intel Capital. I, I think Intel was a great way to just see how a large company thinks and works, and it's, it's definitely been valuable to my portfolio uh, to have uh, that knowledge and background. And, and so I would never, you know, I'm not one of those people who's, you know, against going to a large company and, and uh, you know, building a network and getting some experience within a large company. But if you have something that you really want to do, I would just go ahead and, and just do it. I mean, it's never been a better time right now uh, to, to be an entrepreneur, and especially if you're young and you know don't have a lot of obligations. <laughs> and it's 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 a good time to take that risk. Yeah, the one thing I tell all my students is just understand what you're looking to try and get out of it. Understand what the position entails. So if you go to Google, for example, and you say I'm in the sales, I, I want to learn all the sales techniques, and they say, great, you're going to be in the back end doing analysis over where the next you know, interesting market might be, and that's not what you want to learn, then maybe that's not the right fit. But there are also a lot of startups that will give you a lot of ownership for things. So just understand what you want to get out of it, and then you can map against the roles that are of interest to you to see whether or not that you're going to get the right types of skills out of that particular role. Excellent. Well, I'd like to thank all of our amazing panelists for a wonderful discussion. Thank you so much.